Hello everyone and welcome back to Dragalia Foundry, a fan channel where everything Dragalia Lost can be found. In today's video, I'll be reviewing the Gala Dragalia Remix Summon Showcase. This time around, featuring adventures from the Twinkling Twilight event, we have an alt for Curran, an alt for Cassandra, and we also have Gala Yudin given an appearance rate up on this. Gala Luca also returns on this banner, but does not have a rate up. It's the only other past Gala character that's here. And if you're not familiar with these remix banners, basically, they're a Gala Dragalia where a brand new character or dragon is not introduced. At least a Gala character or dragon is not introduced. Usually they'll introduce some other types of characters like the Yukata Cassandra and Yukata Curran in this case, these two alts. But um, these characters they're introducing will be part of the permanent summoning pool going forward. There will be other opportunities to get them. You may get them randomly in the future. So they're not limited time despite the fact that they're alts. And basically in general, galas tend to be the better time to summon because you have a 6% starting appearance rate for 5 stars compared to a 4% appearance rate normally. So that's kind of like the gist of Gala Dragalias. The remix thing just means that there's no brand new Gala character or dragon, but there are returning Gala characters. And like I said, if you ever are in doubt, you can check here on the appearance rate page. But in this case, it's just Gala Prince or Gala Yurin. And Gala Luka is also here, but doesn't have a summon rate up. So you should never try pull on this if you just want to get Gala Luka. Your chances are extremely low. It may happen to some people just by random chance, but it's not something that you could realistically target and try to achieve. So definitely wait if you just want Gala Luka. But this time around, which is a difference from the last Gala Remix, there's no Gala Dragon or really any dragon given an appearance rate up. So I do think this significantly lowers the value of this showcase. Last time we had a Gala Remix, Gala Mars and Gala Cleo both had an appearance rate up. They're both very, very strong, respectively. And uh, this time around, we just have Gala Prince making a return. And quite frankly, Gala Prince isn't what he used to be. He was a pretty powerful enabler in High Zodiac because he allowed for pretty convenient comps that would forego a healer, run a couple of Gala Princes, they can transform when they fall to low HP. So basically the setup was you would have them intentionally fall to low HP from the opening blast of the trial. That would let them shapeshift into a Cupid who could then heal the team. Um, but nowadays those trials have weaker opening blasts. There's a lot more powerful light units than there used to be when those trials first released. And so it's no longer as much of a necessity or even desirable, I would say, to run a Gala Prince type comp if you're doing High Zodiac. And furthermore, High Zodiac just isn't one of the trials that there's really an incentive to play because you could play Kayan's Wrath instead to get shadow weapons, which are much better than the shadow weapons you get from High Zodiac's trial. So the people who are playing it probably just want the orbs to build up their Dracoliths, or maybe they're trying to collect High Zodiac the dragon from the treasure trade, or for whatever other reason, maybe Fafnir statues still if they're working on that. But the weapons from that trial are not particularly good, so a lot of people prefer to play Kayan, which is a light boss that requires shadow adventurers, but drops really good shadow weapons. So in a nutshell, that's why I would say this is a pretty easy skip. I was suggesting uh, last Gala Dragalia, which was a couple weeks ago, that we'd have to be a little bit more selective about our Galas now because they're happening so frequently. And I thought last Gala would be worse than this one because I thought as a remix, this would probably have a pretty good dragon. But it turns out they decided not to bring a dragon. So I don't think this is better than the last Gala that we had. And I don't think it's likely to be better than the upcoming Gala in two weeks because we've already seen a teaser trailer of chapter 15. And let me just say that a dragon appears in that teaser trailer, a dragon who I think is very likely to appear in a Gala summon at the end of this month. And that will probably be a real reason to summon on a brand new Gala, which is also likely to have, you know, new adventurers, just like this one has new adventures in the form of Yukata Cassandra and Yukata Curran. 
Having said that, obviously if you're a Kern fan or a Cassandra fan, this is going to be your best chance to get them outside of a Dream Summon. So that is something to consider. Like always, or at least recently like always, they announced that uh, Cassandra and Curran will appear in the next summon showcase. But what I think this basically means is that they're going to be part of the permanent summoning pool. And in this case, we've started to really see a pattern the past couple of months. Basically, the pattern is at the end of the month, you get a Gala Dragalia with a new Gala character or dragon and some other new characters that are associated with whatever event is happening or whatever hotness is happening in Dragalia Lust. After that, there is a focus banner for a specific element, which would include those new characters that just released, but the focus banners split up the appearance rate across all characters and dragons in that element only. After that runs for a couple weeks, they do a remix like this one, and then usually after the remixes, they do a dragon special plus a dragon platinum, the platinum being a paid only, and that's a chance to pick up four star dragons. Sometimes good five star dragons are there, but honestly, I don't think it's really as valuable as Gala's because of the lower appearance rate for five stars. So unless you're really early on building up your collection, you're lacking four star dragons, then I don't think that's really a good time to summon, nor is the focus for an element a great time to summon. And then finally, again, at the end of the month, there's another Gala. And often what they'll do when the dragon special is running, they'll also bring back a past banner. So last month they brought back the banner from the previous year, Splash of Adventure. I think after this gala ends, they're gonna bring back eventually the banner for Crescendo of Courage, which ran last year since we know that event is coming back this month. So that's kind of the state of things as far as banners go. Probably a little less exciting than it used to be when we got named banners and there were fewer repeat banners and um, these kind of filler banners that happen in between new events. But at the same time, from a collecting standpoint, it's probably not a bad thing that the best banners to summon on are happening more often. So the fact that new characters appear on the galas means you don't have to choose between summoning on a banner with new characters you really like and saving for a gala where you have better than normal appearance rates. So I think it's kind of a wash. It's maybe a little bit less exciting during the month but it's also a little bit better value probably for most players. And um, because of that, I think you just have to essentially look at like what's the best gala opportunity for me. And that should probably be your summoning decision. So I would say this is skip. I said the last one was a skip as well, but I ended up summoning because I felt Laxie could help me a lot with my um, Master Volk's Wrath uh, solo team comp. And um, I think you could actually say the same of Cassandra, but we'll get into that a little bit. For the rest of this video, I'll just focus on analyzing the three characters since there's only three things that have an appearance rate up. And my verdict on this is that this is probably a skip, but I wouldn't fault anyone for going for some of their favorite characters, of course. So let's start with uh, Cassandra, Yukata Cassandra. She has uh, an interesting kit. She's a flame healer. so. And I guess I should say she's a flame staff healer now that we have other types of healers like Summer Amane, who is an axe healer for whatever reason, but it's great that she is. So Cassandra is a flame staff. We already have several flame staffs in the game. We have Valentine's Hildegard, Verica, Halloween Lowen, and Orion notably. And among those, Halloween Lowen is pretty dominant. Halloween Lowen can buff the entire team's max HP up to 30%. He has a really consistent de uh, defense buff plus regen on his first skill. That's fantastic. And double buff comps, it's really a lot of healing over time because of the regen. He's very easy to build. He's a four star, but he was only available during last year's Halloween Fantasia 2 banner and its rerun, I guess a couple months ago now this year. So he may not be available to you because he is a seasonal character. He would probably be my first investment for a flame healer. But if you don't have him, I would say probably my second choice would be Verica. Verica also has regen on her first skill. She can cleanse stun with it. She has an emergency heal on her second skill that lets you heal the team member with the lowest HP. So she has a nice amount of healing. She also has Dragon's Claws as her Chain Co ability, which is 
not too rare. I mean, it's fairly rare still, but in the flame element, you could get that from Gollumim, of course. But uh, she happens to have it as well. And so she's just a pretty solid healer. She's one of the the old time favorites, I would say, from back in the day when we would run High Midgard Stormer's Trial on Standard and it was pretty tough. So she's a very solid healer as well, but she can't give you that extra tankiness that Lowen does that can kind of just erase a lot of mistakes with his max HP and defense buffs. So she's probably my second choice. Valentine's Hildegard has uh, similar qualities to Verica. Uh, I think she's stun res as well, but she can't cleanse stun. She can uh, provide a small amount of energy to your team, which does add up the more she uses her skills. She can debuff the enemy strength by a tiny amount with her force strike. She's kind of like a more aggressive version of Verica in the sense that if you feel confident in your team comp, then you could use Valentine's Hildegard to also give you energy since you're less preoccupied with uh, healing, I guess. And Orion is kind of in a weird space where he should be aggressive because he has like skill damage and one damage dealing skill. He has a pretty good chain co ability that gives critical rate when you burn an enemy. But unfortunately, his DPS is just really low. His skill damage doesn't have enough outlets. His uh, second skill causes damage, but it's too slow to charge. He can't cleanse anything. So even though he has a mana spiral and he's available to all players for free, I really don't think he has a really strong place in uh, any content right now. And uh, as for Cassandra, as we'll see, she looks to kind of be like a better Valentine's Hildegard, essentially in this slot where she's gonna provide a sort of a safety net as a healer. Like if you choose to run a healer, she's gonna provide a safety net to that extent. But uh, she also is going to be able to bolster your offenses on your team. So let's take a look at her skills. The first one is called Goldfish of the Hereafter. It's shareable, restores HP to all teammates and grants all teammates the fluorescent fish effect for 15 seconds. During fluorescent fish, attacks will deal bonus non-elemental damage to foes based on 20% of the user's strength. This bonus damage is not affected by buffs, abilities, shapeshifting, or punisher effects, and will never deal critical damage or heal the user. The fluorescent fish effect will not stack. All right, so the way I read this, it kind of sounds similar to the fig effect on Galalaxy, like a little spawn or ad that summons uh, like a familiar near each character and then just does some passive damage via attacks over time based on 20% of the user's strength. So obviously the stronger, um, or I should say the more strength oriented your team composition is, the better this is gonna be. In particular, certain dragons like Galamars obviously give you a lot more strength than dragons like, let's say, Konohana Sakuya. So this is going to work better with strength oriented dragons. Obviously you wouldn't want to run a dragon like Sakuya on Cassandra anyway, because she doesn't have any damage dealing skills built in. But uh, interestingly, this applies this buff effect to all teammates. So it's gonna restore HP, a one shot heal, and then give the buff effect. Now it says 20% of the user's strength. So it's hard for me to tell reading this. It's a little ambiguous whether this would be based on Cassandra or based on the teammates. But since she is the user of the skill, I would think that it's based on her strength, which means you would probably want a dragon like Gollumars on her. Nowadays, it's not that important to run an HP oriented dragon as it used to be because you have so many stats from your weapons, from your facilities, like you really don't need an HP oriented dragon on a healer to survive in the way that you used to in the past. Healing does scale more off of HP than it does off of strength, but it does scale off of both. So having a high strength stat is also something that contributes positively toward the amount you heal uh, in the healing formula in this game. So. I think that you would want to run Gala Mars on her most likely, but uh, it's possible I'm reading this wrong and this could depend on your teammate's strength, but most likely your teammates are already trying to run offensive dragons at least, um, if not strength oriented ones. So it's likely that it wouldn't really matter that much, but you probably would want to run a strength oriented dragon on her if, if it does scale off her strength. And, you know, frankly, it's just, it's a good, effect because it's extra passive damage over time. A little hard to compare to energy from Valentine's Hildegard, but 
Valentine's Hildegard doesn't immediately energize. You have to use her skill a couple times. So just thinking about it that way, even though most the damage comes from skills and not basic attacks for most characters, you have her energizing the team so infrequently that I would think pretty clearly and pretty definitively that Goldfish of the Hereafter is a bigger DPS gain than energy from Valentine's Hildegard. So that's why I would say Cassandra kind of slots really nicely into that space. Her second skill also provides a pretty good, pretty good healing coverage. Ritual of Soul Cleansing gradually recovers the entire team's HP for 15 seconds. So it's just straight up a regen effect. The nice thing about regen is it benefits off of buff time. It's going to mean you get an extra tick or so of healing. And Fluorescent Fish also appears to benefit off of buff time. You're going to have that fish last longer on each of your teammates. A lot of healers with regen tend to prefer Worm Prince with buff time, as opposed to just pure Worm Prince with recovery. So uh, I think this makes a lot of sense as far as her kit setup. And I think that's sort of how you'd build her is like, try give her a lot of strength, try give her some buff time. She's a character who could probably use proper maintenance pretty well. That's a print that gives you full HP equals strength as well as buff time. It's something that Durant currently uses and you could throw on other types of buff bots. You could throw it on characters like Lazary whose picture is on the worm print, but I could see it working really well on Cassandra. For her co-abilities, she has recovery of plus 20% fine. This is standard. This is what you expect to see on most staff healers. And then her chain co ability is pretty interesting. We haven't gotten a chain co ability like this before. Flame taking damage equals strength plus 13%. If a team member is attuned to flame, increases their strength by 13% for 15 seconds when they take damage. After activating, it does not activate again for 5 seconds and it benefits your whole team. So this is also, I would say, a reason why she fits really well into this team support, strength-oriented healer slot. This is a pretty strong chain co ability. Having said that, that would only really apply if you're in single player, right? If you're in co-op and you're leading with her, then this does not affect your co-op companions that, uh, you know, other players that you join up with, it would only affect her. But in single player, if she's your healer, this is going to affect your other three adventurers that you're running with and probably increase their DPS a lot. And particularly if they're AI, they might just take random attacks. AI are pretty good at dodging, probably as good as most human players or maybe a little bit better because they can hack and dodge some ridiculous undodgeable things. But uh, in the fights where it's relevant, well, in half of the fights where it's relevant, I should say, in Volk, they do tend to get buffeted and hit by random things sometimes. In uh, Midgard Swarmer, they really don't. Like, your AI are not just going to randomly get hit unless you let them get hit. So this probably wouldn't be very good in High Midgard Swarmer's trial. I mean, you're going to take some unavoidable damage if the fight lasts long enough. Like, you're going to take damage from Tattered Sky, for instance, if you don't clear before then. But generally speaking, all the damage can be avoided in that fight. In Volk, it lasts long enough if you're a soloing expert or you're soloing master, it will last long enough that you're going to take some hits. This will provide a nice DPS boost to your team. So I think that she could be very interesting in that capacity. Um, I've, known, I've known people, I've had friends who have definitely soloed Master Volk's Wrath with Valentine's Hildegard, so you don't need Lowen to do it, even though he provides insurance with uh, his max HP buff. So if you can do it with Valentine's Hildegard, like I'm very confident you could do it with Cassandra and she'd be excellent for it. Probably good if you want to try to do it as quickly as possible. But uh, I don't know how many players are still trying to do that or even interested in soloing that per se. So if you just care about co-op, Lowen might honestly be better because Lowen is considered so safe. And um, you never know what types of players you're going to run with. You know, you might be running with players who are a little less experienced, or maybe somebody just makes a mistake. Lowen has the capacity to recover from unwinnable situations in a way that uh, I don't necessarily think Cassandra is going to have. But I still think that she's she's good if uh, if you're really in that like end game area where you're just doing this stuff on your own. Her abilities are full HP equals strength plus 20%. 
Nice, works with her first skill, presumably. Stun res of 100%, and then skill 2 filled equals strength plus 30%. So, uh, yeah, basically, if you don't have to use your second skill, you're gonna have a ridiculous 50% strength just off her passives if you're also at full HP. So, essentially, the better your game is going, the less you have to heal with her, the more that you're just going to simply be able to deal a lot of damage via fluorescent fish, I would presume. And, um, interestingly, well, I don't know about the name for this, like, this is very clear on what it means, skill 2 filled equals strength, but it's also kind of silly to me that it's just like, this is not the coolest, most exciting name, I feel like it's just the, the literal description of what it does. When you think about how Dragalia has talked about the skill order in the past, right, there's abilities called primed blank, like prime strength, which depends on your first skill being filled. It sounds cool, right? Like prime strength. It doesn't say skill one, uh, skill one charge equals strength or something like that. So um, <laughs> this name is kind of funny to me, but for the life of me, I couldn't think of what would be a better name, like secondary skill charge equals strength or like secondary ready equals strength. Like, there's not an obvious uh, candidate, so I'll allow it. But uh, as you can see, I mean, she could easily have a ridiculous strength aura uh, over 100% total if you consider Worm Prince, her dragon, and her passives. So yeah, I think uh, Yukata Cassandra, pretty good for end game, like more hardcore players who want to push the limits of clear times, that type of thing. Of course, some of those players prefer to run in more aggressive, what we would say are cheese comps, but you know, clear very fast, you know, 15 seconds or whatever, with Marths and Elisands and whatnot. So there are going to be players who are maybe too far along that spectrum of clearing difficult content in really extreme ways. So Yukata Cassandra is in an interesting space where I think you kind of have to be in the middle ground. Like you like to play out the content. Maybe you want to do her, use her in some solo comps. Uh, but uh, otherwise for co-op, I really don't see her being particularly popular just because I think that uh, Lowen is, Lowen is too safe and he's too good in a way. That being said, she's brand new, so if you are going to try to use her, now might be a good time because people might be more receptive, want to experiment, they like Cassandra, they want to see what she's all about, and healers are always in demand for uh, Expert Volk and Master of Volk because a lot of players, even though they've built Halloween low in, for whatever reason, they are not a huge fan of playing as him. So, you know, you may be able to get away with running Cassandra and actually do pretty well for yourself. All right, now let's talk about Curran. So Yukata Curran, I love his outfit. I love Curran, Curran's a great character. I'm really looking forward to finishing up the story on this event to see what happens. Lathna also makes a cameo and uh, even have a little cute Jupiter mask here. So one of the best portraits I've seen in a long time. I love that they gave Curran the freedom to have his own alt. Like, he exists outside of Heinwald now. Even though Heinwald made an appearance in the story, I just think that's pretty cool. It opens up some fun space for both characters to do their own thing, and uh, I like that about it. Corinne is a light dagger. As for light daggers, it's again a pretty strong pool of candidates. There are some light daggers which are almost never used, such as Fritz. There are others like Mitsuhide and Floor, who are um, who are both quite good. Mitsuhide has some advantages over Floor. Floor arguably can have some advantages over Mitsuhide as well, and she has probably the higher chance of getting a Mana Spiral, putting her squarely above Mitsuhide in terms of her damage potential. One of the nice things I like about Mitsuhide though is her combo time chain co ability. It's um, it's pretty helpful for characters like Galaluka, any character who wants to run Primal Crisis. So I find her to be a pretty nice backliner, and that's something that I don't think I could say for Floor. There's uh, other light daggers. There's Irfan. Sadly, Irfan just not really used for anything. He could definitely use a Mana Spiral as well. 
But uh, right now it's a pretty strong set of candidates, but again, we don't really know what's going to be desirable for future Shadow content and High Zodiac, as I was talking about with Gala Yudin toward the opening of this video, High Zodiac is not really a fertile grounds for testing. So later this month, we're going to get Tartarus, the final of the Agito, or maybe second to last of the Agito, depending on how things go. And once we get him, we'll have a better sense of like what type of light character do we want? What type of properties are actually beneficial? How hard is it to keep a combo? How good is ranged versus melee? What type of team comp do you want? There's all these types of considerations and hopefully it's something very different than High Zodiac just so we see and feel something fresh. Like they've done a pretty good job with the Agito not being like the same element Dragon Trials or High Dragon Trials. So I'm looking forward to that, but keep that in mind when we talk about Yukata Kuren, we're not necessarily gonna know how good he'll square up against that content until it's out. But as for his skills, he has Ricochet Bullets, which is shareable at a low four, and then Maskable Faith. Ricochet Bolts, I said bullets, but it's bolts, deals light damage to enemies directly ahead. If this skill is used during Maskable Faith mode, it will also inflict paralysis. All right, simple enough. And then Maskable Faith activates Maskable Faith mode. If this skill is used during Maskable Faith mode, a variant called Shimmering Pinwheels will be used instead. Shimmering Pinwheels deals light damage to enemies directly ahead and inflicts stun. This skill can only be used when the user's HP is 50% or above, and Maskable Faith Mode will automatically be deactivated when the user's HP falls below 30% of their max HP. Alright, interesting. So, the last sentence, it's not clear whether this skill means Shimmering Pinwheels or whether it means maskable faith, or whether it means both. This is an example of ambiguity that happens pretty often. So if you have Karin, you may know how this works. But when it says this skill after shimmering pinwheels, we really don't know, or I don't know what it's talking about. What I would have to presume is that um, it's probably, let's see. It's probably Shimmering Pinwheels because um, it says that Maskable Faith Mode will be deactivated when your users, when the user's HP falls below 30%. So I guess you can't use Shimmering Pinwheels when your HP is between 30 and 50. And if your HP falls below 30, then you're also going to lose the mode and then this will switch back to the Maskable Faith skill. So that's my interpretation of this, is that you have to keep your HP above 50 to continue spamming Shimmering Pinwheels once you've activated Maskable Faith once. And if your HP is between 30 and 50, then you can't use Shimmering Pinwheels, but you also don't lose your mode. So there's a chance to recover, but if it falls to 30% or below 30%, I should say, then you also lose your mode. You would have to reuse this skill to get into this mode again. Let's read the co-ability and the chain co-ability and the abilities. So critical rate plus 10% and then light energy equals shadow res plus 8%. I'm not really high on um, resistance abilities as far as chain co-abilities. They do matter a little bit more than I probably gave them credit for when evaluating chain co-abilities as a whole. But um, they matter, you need a reason for them to matter, I should say. Like it can matter, but it's, it's like if you really need to meet an HP check or you're having trouble with a character surviving or something, like maybe you have a lot of ranged characters and you need to cover them with shadow resistance. So it can matter, but conditional on energy, I feel like this is very unlikely to matter. Maybe Tartarus will deal enough damage that like you need all the shadow revs that you can get and maybe he can only be damaged by energized skills or something ridiculous, and then this will actually be kind of good, but it seems unlikely to be good. Critical rate is fine. It's something I overrated. I didn't realize how much it suffers from diminishing returns, but it does. So critical rate, probably not as good as I considered it in my co-ability and chain co-ability video, but it's still at base with no other forms of critical rate. This is like a 7% DPS increase and the more critical rate you already have, the less of a DPS increase it is. I think, it, think at minimum it's like 
a 5.4% increase or something. I don't know. I'm pulling that number from memory, so that might be totally wrong, but it does diminish. That could be just a diminished tier after you have a certain amount. I don't remember which amount. Anyway, let's look at the abilities now. Multiple skill hits equals energy level up to. So this energizes the user every time the ricochet bolt skill hits enemies 10 times during the same combo. Aha! Poison res 100%, and then energy equals strength and critical rate 3. So this is going to give you strength and critical rate as your energy level increases. It caps out at 20% strength and 8% critical rate. That is super nice. You're going to be able to energize yourself a lot, presumably, with the ricochet bolt skill. But you have to... That skill has to hit enemies 10 times during the same combo. So obviously, there's something here that we're not seeing. This is probably a character that you have to watch in action or play yourself to really get a sense for how good he is because there's no indication here of how many hits this does, how cheap this is to charge, what the damage output is. I think um, I would expect this to do maybe like a thousand to three thousand damage depending on how many hits it has and like you connect with. It sounds like there's some type of hit control element like moving during the skill but it obviously doesn't say that so we can't really infer that. Um, or maybe it just charges really quickly so you could feasibly have the same combo and use this skill twice and maybe it hits like five times each or six times each and you just have to land a certain number of them. So unfortunately, I really can't evaluate Curran based on this. He's just very, um, very unclear based on what's written here. We might be able to pull a trailer. So um, if we're able to pull a trailer, I will include one. But if not, we're going to have to move on to Gala Yudin. All right, Gala Yudin it is. So Gala Yudin, also called Gala Prince. I talked about him toward the beginning of this video, but he's a character who had a moment to shine against Expert High Zodiac and Master High Zodiac for a time because he allowed for teams that didn't need a proper healer. So what makes Gala Prince kind of interesting is that he is a dragon crisis character. Like he gets to become a dragon when he's at low HP once per quest and uh, he also has some other dragon oriented mechanics but it was mainly that factor that made him kind of good he also is a pretty decent buff bot rising circlet creates a buff zone that doesn't last very long but it's a good strength buff certainly not worth sharing i would strongly suggest you do not share this it's just too expensive for the buff that you get Xiao Wu Jing is a much better shared skill as far as creating a zone. He creates a debuff zone, but it tends to be better. Um, and I think it's cheaper, but I'm not sure. But I think it's better for sure. As far as Rising Circlet, one of the applications is Gala Yudin is pretty good in raids because when you create a buff zone, it benefits all 16 characters in the raid, not just your own team. So that's one place he's pretty useful. His second skill is Exalted Glory, which does a lot, but it charges up slowly over time. So it deals light damage to enemies directly ahead, inflicts paralysis, and increases the entire team's strength and defense by 15% for 15 seconds, and everybody gets a 1U shield that nullifies damage less than 20% of the user's maximum HP. The shield doesn't stack, and then this skill gauge fills up over time automatically. It does technically fill up by attacking enemies but it's completely negligible because the sp cost is like ridiculous i think it's like a million or maybe it's either 999,000 or 999,000. um but i think it's closer to a million but i'm not sure but it's essentially arbitrarily high and so you just have to wait for it to charge up you should be able to use it I think two times in Mercurial Gauntlet without any other type of interference or possibly three, but um, it charges up at a fairly slow cadence. I don't remember the exact cadence. The way around that was to use things like Force Charge. So it's pretty common to run Gala Yudin with Sister's Day Out, which gives you Force Charge, meaning you'll charge up your skills when you use a Force Strike partially. That also gives Force Strike damage, which for Gala Yudin, his second skill does okay damage, but it's super slow, so it doesn't deal a lot of damage over time. His first skill does very negligible damage, so you don't really want skill damage wear imprints on him. It's better to just increase his strength or make it so that he can cast his skills more frequently via things like skill charge 
possibly even skill haste, but I haven't seen a skill haste setup for him just yet. So the cool thing about Exalted Glory that I'll mention is that it's actually a nod to a lot of the other campaign characters. So it inflicts paralysis, which is something Luca does. It increases the entire team's strength, which is something Alessand does. Defense, which is something Cleo does, and gives the entire team a shield, which is something that Ronzel does. And you actually see them in the animation, the portrait for the skill, and I think that's really cool. But uh, basically, the way this was used was the Chocolatiers would let you use this at the beginning of a quest. Two Gallic Yudens would use this so that you'd get a 30% defense buff to the entire team. This would allow everybody to survive those trials without running defensive worm prints to prevent damage. But um, basically since then we've just gotten other characters. Halloween Alisan has a mana spiral now. Uh, we got Dragon Yule Maldara that winter. She had a defense co-ability. The opening blast now does less damage so you're not even guaranteed to really get your Yudin to fall to low HP range. Uh, we've had other characters like Xiaowu Jing, Xu Bajie, Radiant Chuan Song, Gala Luka, Mitsuhide, Hanabusa, um, Chitose, like a lot of light characters have come out since that trial was really relevant and those comps were running. So this is completely broken open now. You don't need that type of setup anymore. It's not as demanding as it was. Some of the interesting things about Gala Yudin that may give him potential in the future though, I would say are his co-ability and chain co-ability. His co-ability increases your dragon damage, passive damage over time, which is kind of nice. Um, not passive damage over time, but like it increases your dragon damage modifier. Sorry, I don't know why I said passive over time, but doing auto attacks as a dragon, this will increase your damage. It will also increase your damage, um, you know, from skills that you use as a dragon. And it extends your shapeshift time by 20%. Um, chain co-ability, shapeshift equals HP regen of six. So this gives you a small HP regen buff every time you shapeshift. Right now, it doesn't really have too many applications, like neither of these do, but if there is ever a dragon-centric character that really wants to be going in and out of shapeshifts and has a really good dragon form, in light particularly, this could be interesting. Like, let's say we get a Lathna alt. I know it doesn't look like we're gonna get one, but let's say we get a Lathna ult that's light element, she has a really good Nyarlathotep form or something, and she has Dragon's Claws like to benefit her from transforming, or we get a Forte ult. Um, there are ways that this could become more interesting, so I will say that for this. And um, maybe even the regen could be used to substitute for healing if Tartarus has like dragon tanking segments of the fight where it's very common for all players to shapeshift at the same time and tank. Well, maybe there's some uses here, but I'm not too confident in it. As far as abilities, Yudin has Dragon's Lights Resolve 2, which reduces Dragon Gauge depletion over time by 30% and increases attack rate when shapeshifted by 10%. The depletion reduction thing, I think, is a way of saying it extends your dragon time effectively. Perhaps Tartarus will have some type of dragon depletion mechanics, like uh, we saw with Void Zephyr and some of the other Void battles, like Dragon Delay. And I guess this might block them, but I don't... I'm not sure. We should be able to test that now, but I'm not sure it even does that with how it's worded. It also increases attack rate when shapeshifted by 10%, though, and that is a pretty nice bonus, but only applies to Yudin himself. And then Sacred Shield 2, Poison and Curse Res. Right now, Yudin is the only, I want to say the only light adventurer who has both Poison and Curse Res built in. They're not too cheap to, or they're not too costly to put onto a character because there are worm prints like Heavenly Holiday. There's, uh, there's some light affliction guard prints that you could use if both of these afflictions are particularly punishing but uh, Curse in particular is well cleansed. Hildegard cleanses that pretty well herself. Poison's a little harder to cleanse. Only Felicia cleanses that right now and it's on her second skill. So something to consider for future content. But uh, Gala Luka got essentially potent Curse Res instead of getting both resistances, I believe. And then finally, Gala Yudin has Draconic Charge 2, which is what I have been referring to. Essentially gives you a free dragon whenever your HP falls to 30% once per quest. You gotta be careful though, if your Dragon Gauge is already filled, you're not gonna get any benefit from this. So uh, do keep that in mind. 
And finally, I've beat a dead horse often on this, but uh, the other disadvantage to Gala Yudin is that you can't run regular Yudin in your team comp, meaning you're not going to take advantage of regular Yudin's player EXP plus 15% ability. I think it's a good passive ability to have in all your teams. So um, that is a consideration as well as you don't really get that benefit if you are running Gala Prince. But anyway, y'all, I think we've pretty much covered everything on this banner at this point. Sorry I couldn't go more in depth on Yukata Kurin, but uh, I tried my best with what information we were given. That is pretty much going to do it for this video. So let me know if you're going to be summoning on this, if you're going to be skipping. Let me know what you thought about the event as well. I'll probably post a video doing the Astral Midgard Swarmer battle and maybe use that video as an opportunity to talk about the story once I played it. I was going to make a story about the Doomsday Getaway event, but uh, or a video about its story, but I ended up just not really falling in love with the event in the way I hoped I would, so I decided not to post that video. It was also super long reading through the story, it took like over an hour, so I decided not to go for that, and uh, instead I'm looking forward to this story, and I'll probably post my reaction just in the form of me playing Astral. High Midgard Sormer and uh, and casually talking about it instead of reading through the entire thing on video. But that is going to do it for today, everyone. So thank you as always for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>